we're going to look at an extremely large painting by the Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky working in Munich uh, in 1913. Uh, this is a painting that's in Moscow now. So it's a year before the First World War began. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and this is called Composition Number 7. Kandinsky actually used a lot of really abstract titles. Um, he painted a number of compositions. And he painted a number of improvisations. This is the so kind of title. So from music. Yeah, music. This is, this exactly. Is, right, as if yeah. this was orchestration. It is orchestration for him. There are various things that are important to Kandinsky, and one of them is the way that color is indelibly connected to music and to other senses. We see certain sounds and we hear certain colors. So this almost synesthetic mm -hmm. experience, right? Yes. There's a kind of alliance, there's a kind of natural uh, pairing of color and sound, or color and shape. I thought it was all the senses, a connecting of all the it senses. It can be. I mean, I think there are different experiences. I think, like, the soup tastes blue. Exactly. Right. One. Or the letter B is yellow. So I have a story about that. Because when I was three, and I went to the doctor, and my throat hurt, the doctor said, how does your throat feel? And I said, red. And I remember shouting, red! I just remember feeling that it felt the color red. So, so that was is. my main way of expressing how my throat felt. So you know, maybe there is just this connection between the senses, and maybe there is a sense, I think, that Kandinsky kind of talks about this in maybe not in exactly this way, but that our brains sort of ruin that. Yeah. That we grow up and we understand convention, more and more disassociated from those sort right. of primal connections. Kandinsky spent a lot of his life trying to reclaim that, though. Right. right? If we look back at the painting. I keep <laughs> looking at it and then looking away, and then looking at it again and trying to make sense of it. And I think one of the things that's difficult for me about Kandinsky is that I don't really know what he's doing a lot of the time. Then if I try not to think about what he's doing so much and more about what it looks like and maybe something about what it sounds like. He named his composition, his uh, paintings composition or improvisation. He was also friends with one of the great early modern composers, the Viennese composer Arnold Schoenberg. So Schoenberg works um, with atonal sounds and atonal systems and compositions. And if you listen to Schoenberg's music, and you look at Kandinsky's painting, I think it makes so much more sense. I think we have a little bit, right? Oh. I think we do. When I listen to Schoenberg and when I listen to atonal music, I often feel like there are there's a real attempt to shape sound and let it exist as somehow as this sort of abstract almost representation of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do see a kind of affiliation between that and what some of the artists of this period are doing, especially somebody like Kandinsky. I think the separation of the representation from the natural world, whether it's sound and music, separated from a narrative composition, or yeah. whether it's... But, but music, composition, I mean, um, sort of high music, uh, what we now call classical music, mm -hmm. is, is often disassociated. I mean, there are examples, of course, Beethoven sometimes, you know, in the Sixth Symphony will, will be mimicking some sort of storm. Mm -hmm. but, but very often there isn't that direct narrative. There is a kind of inherent abstraction. In music. In mm -hmm. music, but when you get to the atonal, more conscious reference to the to the sound of music itself, to the representation of music almost, mm -hmm. which I see as sort of more paired to this more self-conscious abstraction in painting. Mm -hmm. But you've just called on, I think, a really important and really significant kind of distinction between painting and music, which is painting has always tried to craft something that it's not. And music has been much more comfortable historically, I think, with its inherent abstraction. Music, it so specifically changes mood. Um, and it allows you to sort of stay in that different space and it evokes emotion. It sort of brings you to that very particular place. So listening to the Schoenberg, it feels really uncomfortable to me, to my ears. It's not something that's pleasant. I start to feel physically discomforted. I just don't mm -hmm. really like it. But that's part of what the idea is. Mm -hmm. Painting, at this point, the moderns 
in the early 20th century and are trying to cause a kind of disruption. I yeah. think that's a really interesting question. I mean, what is it about atonality or dissonance or in the Kandinsky painting, you know, forms that don't look so obviously harmonious, mm -hmm. you know, like in this painting where there's shapes and lines moving in different directions, kind of sense of, you know, parts clashing together and coming together in that kind of dissonant way. Mm -hmm. That kind of disruption you know, of space. What is it yeah. about modernism that sort of asks for the disruption of melody and harmonious mm -hmm. sound and and sees atonality as a more effective representation of itself. Kandinsky is really trying to evoke his particular subjective experience of a color or of a shape or whatever else he's looking at. He's sort of creating that subjective moment, making it look specifically non-referential um, and non-naturalistic. It's not about making a bridge look like a bridge. It's about what do you feel like when you're crossing a bridge? What is that do to you. So if you look at the top, like, I mean, is that a horizon line up there? I don't know, you know, but what does he do? Is this a landscape? Figure out what anything is. And I think that that's his point. It does feel like it's a painting about a kind of conflict of the forms themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right. I think he, he sort of pushes past our, our desire to associate this with landscape or still life or some sort of representation, even if it's abstracted. Mm -hmm. And we sort of get He's very successful, I think, in sort of pushing us to a to another point where we actually can take seriously this notion of form and color beginning to have conflict in and of itself, mm -hmm. um, in in a sense making the abstract legitimate. Red against yellow, blue with yeah. green. Yeah, and, and in some ways that's what the music that we just listened to was doing as well. Mm -hmm. The very term atonal is speaking of this kind of conflict between sound. Something about the modern world, though, that doesn't feel like it matches. In classical music, harmony. there's right. a kind of narrative There's a narrative, harmony. and there's a resolution, even if right. it's disrupted. Yes. So there's that, here, there's that sense of, you know, things coming, of the center not holding, yeah. right, to use yeah. Yeats, right, to, you know, things coming apart, of yeah. things not, you know, of the world not not having a, a narrative that, that explains it, that makes sense, that you know, represents human beings' position in the universe anymore. It's so seductive to then say, okay, this is 1913, the, sec the First World War is about to break out, right. right? All of those players are there. And I think we have to be very careful about doing that. But nevertheless, this is a world that is really in, sort of a moment of crisis. I think the idea of apocalypse is inescapable here. We haven't talked about it yet, but in looking at it, it feels like Kandinsky is really working mm -hmm. with ideas of apocalypse, that he's looking to, to kind of destroy and then renew, which is a really seductive idea for the artists at this time. It really is yeah. among the Italian at, futurists Yeah, also. among a lot of them, like yeah. destroy so what's what is there. That? And because in order to make something new, you have to destroy what's already there. And also there. this notion of just this... this um, wipe it all away. Mm -hmm, wipe Absolutely. it away. And, and create a utopia that, yeah. that, that would replace it. And to me, I think one of the things that's really amazing is that this is before World War One, and, and so much changes after World War One. I, I think when they realize, mm -hmm. you know, everyone sort of wipe realizes, everything wipe out everything is out is such a not, good idea. No, it actually doesn't <laughs> and we, do anything necessarily good. And, and, <laughs> right, and, and now we have the technology that actually allows us to do that. Yeah. Right? Right. We have machine guns, we have, and yeah. look what happens. Wow, people are maimed and horribly yeah. disfigured, yeah. and it's actually not as And pretty. people don't come back. No, they don't, and they don't right. have, um, you know, visions cars. that give them access to new truths. They just sort of see basically how horrible people are to one another. And so I think this is sort of before that. There's a kind of utopian idea of what apocalypse will bring, that it'll bring some kind of inner truth. Is there also a sort of a religious, I mean, There's a, a spiritual, kind of spiritual aspect definitely. here? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Kandinsky wrote on the spiritual and art in 1911, two years before he paints this, and he evokes a lot of connection between color and art and faith and spirituality, sort of having that so, core belief in something. For him, the modern world has lost that mm -hmm. spirituality, that innocence, that connection to emotion mm -hmm. and sort of primal emotion, and the apocalypse might restore that mm -hmm. to Absolutely. human beings, what culture in a way has stolen from us. It's yeah. a very primitivist it, idea. It, I find this painting, the, the colors, the, the, the connections yeah. of everything, the things m moving apart and coming together, I mean, it's you know, when I when I allow myself to 
have colors and lines and shapes just sort of suggest feelings and tastes and smells, then I think this painting becomes really enjoyable. There's a kind of incredible freedom here that you use the word expressionist that's that's so different from later Kandinsky, where mm -hmm. things become so much more systematized in a way and clarified. Um, there's there's a wonderful sense of invention here. And it's large, so it would have been really, really immersive. Yeah. You know, one wonders like the extent to which he was like trying to give us a kind of grand statement. A symphony. I guess the longer that I look at it, I can understand more of it, but I have a hard time really enjoying it. It's a tough painting. It's a tough painting. It is I think it's, painting. it's it's meant to be tough. Maybe that's... that's it's a idea. tough moment. And it's interesting that it's still tough. Mm -hmm. Duchamp and Warhol mm -hmm. and the whole century of modernism and postmodernism have passed, and this is still a difficult part. Schoenberg work. is still tough. Yeah. Right? Schoenberg is still tough. Yeah. So that says a lot. It does. There's still a lot of power. Mm -hmm.